All right. Um, one thing I wanted to share is we do have the time right here. Uh, Ray Burkholder, you can make your way up. Uh, we have the time right here. We're going to give Ray 40 minutes. We're going to give Ray twice the amount. Um, I met Ray and Martha, I believe, for the first time. Was it in the, at the conference last year? Was that when we first? No, we talked before that. Well, I don't know. We talked. Before that, but we that's talked. The first time we met. Yeah. And so uh, Ray was, uh, and Martha were still Amish at that time. And I remember Chris Byler over here coming up, praying over them. And, uh, and just, just at that moment, at that time, I didn't know a lot about Ray, but he's one of the, how many is on our texting group? Is it five guys? I think it's six. Six guys. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, Ray is one of the guys that is constantly at war with Samuel Girat over Fords and GMs. And, uh, well, he always we, starts it. He, he, he does. Always. <laughs> <laughs> but we do Zoom calls. We try to do a Zoom call every other week if we can at all make it. And those Zoom calls are uh, very precious. We do Bible studies. We talk about life. Uh, and it's just, uh, these are our guys. The, I, I love these guys. And you are going to be blessed by Ray's testimony. I don't think I've ever heard a more heart-wrenching uh, uh, testimony in the, in the 20 years that I've been in ministry. Don't think I could say I heard a more gut-wrenching testimony than what Ray and Martha had to go through. And um, I got to share this. Uh, so we, Ray, went, uh, Ray and Martha went out to Lancaster here a couple weeks ago with me. At, not with me. They drove. They're an hour and a half away from here up in Middlefield. I'm down here in Ashland. I'm just, I'm by myself. I'm driving along the, uh, the toll road and I'm thinking, okay, the next pull off, I'm going to pull off. Now, I had not talked to Ray at all. I didn't know where they were at. I go in there. Lo and behold, there's Ray and Martha in there. And it, I thought that was so special, yeah, it wasn't was, it? That it was, was awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, put the mic right up close. Uh, I have, have some people here that are a little bit hard of hearing, but. Uh, <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> where do I even start? Uh, I guess we were here last year and it just touched our hearts. And I, I already had made up my mind if Joe has another one, that we'll be here. But this was like back in October one day, I was in, at work and I was working and all of a sudden, this conference just kept coming up in my mind. It just, I'd keep working, you know, I just working by myself, installing some doors, and just kept working in my mind, and <clears throat> all day, I was like, because I, I, was, I was like thinking, well, well, should I share or shouldn't I share, you know, or, because, you know, I would rather just sit back in a corner, but... Um, so then I get home that night and I check my emails. And here Matt Ministry had sent out an email that day that said they were looking for speakers. So I guess that's why I'm here. But <laughs> so anyways, um, it's been a journey. It's uh, uh unimaginable journey really um, but uh, yeah so I guess the way I should start maybe is where we have nine children um, six of them married three of them were still at home with us close family they came home on Sunday evenings we made dinner for them and no fuss you know I'm the sec second oldest guy to go into church. I'd get the guys to sing. And I guess they liked me from what I'd been hearing. But uh, uh, I just, well, I guess one time I was in like politics a lot. And, and, and all of a sudden one day I realized that what is truth? You know, uh, I would you would hear this, then you would hear something else that would refute that or it wasn't quite 
the way I heard it. And then it's just kind of like, well, what is truth? Well, I always knew without a doubt that the Bible would be true, but I didn't know what the Bible said. So I talked to my brother a little bit. We said, we talked about some things sometimes. And, and he said, on a, he mentioned a couple of preachers that sometimes he listens to. And, and uh, so I... I, and, and all I have a, a successful carpentry business for 25 years, and I basically ran it from at home at the house. I had a, an office in the house. I, you know, made the phone calls, you know, put out the fires, and went and looked at jobs and stuff like that. So, um, so time goes on, and 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 uh, and I just. I, I, I got, I got, I listened to one of these preachers one time, and I realized that, and, and I, in the back of my mind is I always knew that some of the things that, 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 I, that I would be hearing, that we would be here at church, I just kind of wondered about it. It's just like, I'm not sure that that's true, but I couldn't say that it wasn't because I didn't know what this book said. So... I got, I figured, well, I was going to go find out what the book says so I know, so I know what it said. So next time somebody says something wrong, I can, if, if I, depending on the situation, I can tell them, you know, that's not what the book says. But, so I started studying and studying and, and I accidentally fell in love with Jesus. <laughs> It wasn't intentional. I mean, I was always told my whole life, you can't know that you're saved or anything like that. You know, it's just, it wasn't even, that wasn't even in my mind. I just wanted to know what it said. And it, it got so <clears throat> powerful that I would, like, wake up 3 o'clock in the mornings, a lot of time for a long time. I would go make coffee, and I would sit down, and I would read and study the Bible, and I wouldn't quit till sometimes 11 o'clock in the morning, just hours. And then when I would be done, I'd have to go look at a job or something like that. I would just take this Bible, and I would hold it tight, and I says, oh, I love you, Jesus. I just love you. And I'll do anything for you. But... Martha, my wife, was not on board with me. We didn't even talk about it, really. But you could feel it, the tension a little bit. Um, so time went on. I just prayed for her all the time. And, and eight months later, one night, or one morning, she confronted me and, uh, over something I said that wasn't even, it didn't re warrant that kind of a reaction but and then she started telling me how Jesus was talking to her the week before on how it don't matter what I do she has to stay Amish well I never said anything how could she know that you know how I even think she was saying well you know that she accepted Jesus years ago that I that she, but she doesn't think like I do well we never talked about so how could she think like I think how, how would she know how I thought so anyways and then she just kind of like, and I was just like walking away because I didn't want to like, uh, you know, I didn't want to argue. I, that's not really me. I, I'd, I'd rather just walk away. So I, I had got my coffee. I was out in the kitchen to do this. And as I was walking away, I was like, you know, and it just, just hit me when she said Jesus to talk to her last week because I knew she wasn't saved. And I was like, well, it just really confused me because I was like, that's not the Jesus I know. You know, and as I'm, and I just take a couple steps walking away, and I, and I think, well, she says evil spirit, so I says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And I just turned around and I told her, just so you know, it has nothing to do with works. Well, I didn't know it, but she got born again right there. I walked back to the office, I got my Bible, and I opened up to Ephesians 2, and I slid across the table, it says, here, read chapter 2. And she never said anything. I didn't even know it until that, that evening at 7 o'clock, I think it was, before I realized that she had gotten born again. But, and it was such a joy to me because when I, 
when I became born again, I had no one to share it to. I was the only one in the house. They, you know, I, I couldn't express it. I couldn't do anything like that because I wasn't allowed to. It's something kind of funny when you, when Jesus comes into your life that you automatically know that you can't talk about it. Isn't that something? Because you know you're going to get in trouble if you do. So, and then when this happened to her, I'm here to tell you, we didn't sleep for like four nights. We didn't sleep. It was just, you know, I could express, it was like me getting born again, again, because, you know, I could finally express myself, have someone to talk to. It was just such a, you know, I mean, we just talked and talked and talked. She was like pushing me away. She always says, accuses me to this day that she, you know, like Christians usually starting out are on milk, and then they're supposed to progress into meat. She was always telling me she, she started off on steaks. So <laughs> I'm not sure what she's talking about, but so anyways, we had a our sixth child, it was a a daughter. She was planning on getting married last June. Oh, this, with Martha, this happened for, uh, uh, fe February of, of, of last year. And actually about six weeks before the last year's conference here. Um, but so we had this wedding to look forward to in June. We knew, well, we can't, we can't say anything to our married children or anything because, you know, we didn't want to make a, an issue and cause a wedding to be canceled because of us, so we just kind of kept quiet about it, well, it's basically like, so it started with, I was walking on eggshells until she seen it, and then we had to walk on eggshells because of, we didn't want the word to come out, we did, we didn't really say too much to our young, three children at home, because the reason we didn't, because we didn't want the word to come out, basically, but we did say a little bit, let him watch one small video one time. And just told them that we weren't taught right, according to what the Bible teaches. And the, the ages were 16, 14, and 12 at the time. And so, so it just goes on, and, and we have the wedding. And, and the wedding is uh, uh, a great time. It just went smooth. It wasn't no issues. This was on a Thursday, and I, don't, I noticed our married children, some of the, they were like that, that, that day that we had the wedding there at the house, they were kind of like reserved, they were like talking, uh, you know, off to the side sometimes and stuff. And, well, then, you know, Monday evening, uh, that, that the very next Monday, this was on a Thursday, uh, Mondays, evenings, um, my... Uh, my daughter that had just gotten married, we had an apartment on the property, and she was, they were living in there. So she, they, uh, they asked my, uh, to the, uh, uh, our daughter and our, our youngest son that was still there, the 16-year-old had, had, he was at, at work, working. But the, the other two younger ones were there, and the daughter that had just gotten married asked them if they wanted to go down to my other daughters. My, uh, one of my other daughters, just lived down the street about a half a mile. They walked back and forth with scooters or whatever all the time. So they asked if they can go down there with them after, after dinner that night. So while, while Martha, all of, she just had this, the Holy Spirit just was warning Bell. So she says, no, you can't go. And so I didn't think much of it at the time. She did, Martha didn't really say anything to me other than she told me they can't go down there. And then right after dinner, the newlyweds left to go down there because they weren't going to be a part of it. And then our other married children show, show up in a van. And I was back in my office. And the two youngest ones were still there uh, in the house. And I think she told, Martha told me that the, the kids are here. So I was coming out of my office. Well, in the meantime, my oldest son you know, opened the door and, and told my two youngest children, which were right there, get, get out of here. You need to go down to Susie's house like we told you or like we wanted you to. So they were like, and Martha's like, no. And they just 
They were just like a matter of a second. They were gone before they were gone before I could even make it out to the kitchen. That's how quick it happened. And then they said, "Well, we're going to talk. We, we, we want to talk. We want to talk." So on the front patio there. So Martha was still fixing coffee, I think, and so they were in a hurry, and, and they were just like, "Hurry up, you know, we want to talk to you." And then get out there, and my oldest son looks at me, and says, "What are you doing to us?" I, says, I don't know what you're talking about, because. At that time, I, I never went to another church. I never did anything. The only thing I ever did was read my Bible. That's it. I was never in trouble in church or anything. And I've been going faithfully to church every time. I never missed once. Well, and then he started, my oldest son told Martha, Mom, come on, hurry up. So when she comes walking out across the porch, I wasn't watching Martha, but my old son looked at it and said, Mom, why are you smiling like that? And she's like, all I know is I have Jesus. And they oh, yeah, we knew it, we knew it. Yeah, yeah. They just kind of used to start yelling and hollering and just walking away and yelling and screaming. And they just, they just came at us like vicious, like they just, just totally just exploded right there. You couldn't tell them, you couldn't try to talk to them, you couldn't say anything. You just couldn't say anything. Because, you know, finally we and her just went back into the house. Oh, they told us, uh, I had three, three of them were working for me at the time. Three Amish were working for me at the time. They all quit right there. He told them right in my face, that we're done. You're on your own. Um, and came up in our face and told me, I promise you, you will never, never see your children again. And, and you, you could try to talk to them. It didn't matter. Well, in the meantime, my, one of my daughters jumped on a scooter, and she went down to her own house where, 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 where the kids were, were at because she was in a hurry to get back down, hurry to get down there to talk to them. Um, and then this, <clears throat> they, they went out to the barn. Me and Martha went in the house. And then literally two minutes later, her, her, uh, Martha's sister lived down the street, about five houses down the street. Her and her husband show up. So, so then I knew that it was planned. It was all pre-planned. And they came in, they, they stopped and talked to them. And then they came in and talked to us, and tried to talk to us. And I told them flat out, I, you know, as soon as they opened the door, I says, you know, if you don't have scripture, I want you to leave. Because by then we were just, you know, up in the air. We were just kind of scared, didn't know what was going to happen and, and how this was going to go. So, and then they, they just kind of override me. I tried to show her something in the Bible. She... Uh, knocking the Bible out of my hand, but I want no part of it. And, you know, the first thing out of her mouth was, well, what would our grandparents say? You know, that's the first thing they said. Well, you know, but anyway, since they went out to the barn, and then they, they had a powwow out there again. Me and, her, me and Martha were just at the house, and then, and then uh, I see my brother-in-law take off out the driveway, then literally, a couple, you know, five, ten minutes later, the ministers show up. All four ministers show up. So that told me also that it was planned because there's no way they could have gotten together that quick. So they came and, and then they stopped and talked to our children on the way in. I met them. I went outside. I wouldn't let them in the house. And I had my Bible with me, which later I got condemned for that because I had Bible with me. Because uh, I guess you're not supposed to do that. Um, so, so they wanted to sit and talk and then he started to explain how, he tried to explain to me how, um, how there's only one God and, and, and all this stuff. And, and then I remembered a sermon that he had preached uh, uh, about a month before that. I says, oh, by the way, I says, that reminds me. Well, in the meantime, I forgot to say, in the meantime, Martha's like, you know, the kids, the kids, the small kids, you know. Well, so we, we even ended up getting a taxi Neighbor lady to take Martha down and get the children. And my oldest son was protecting them. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let her get close to them. They had the blankets over their heads. They were yelling and screaming, saying they don't, they don't want to ever go back home. And, and my oldest son that was still at home, the 16-year-old, was like between, he would not let Martha get close to him. So, so she's like, so finally she ends up coming back home. Well, in the meantime, we're telling, you know, the kids got to come home, and they just kept telling us, no, you might as well forget it. You're never seeing them again. 
ever. And so when the ministers came, this first thing I did was I says, you know, the children have to come home. I said, well, they don't, they don't, the way I understand it, they don't want to come home. I said, I don't care if they don't want to come home. They have to come home. We're their parents. I said, well, they, they don't like the way you think. I said, it doesn't matter what I think. My children have to come home. The flower refused. So then he was telling me how the devil is one God, and then that's when I told him, I says, well, here a while back, you said, they said, that, you know, the Muslims have their way to get to God. The Catholics have their way of getting to God, and the Amish have their way of getting to God. I told him, no, 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 no. I said, no, no. I said, you were wrong. I said, there's only one Lord. Ephesians 4 or 5 says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And no one comes to the Father than by me. There's not numerous ways into heaven. There's only one. You know. And they just got looked at me. And he was telling me, he started telling me on, on what I promised on, on, you know, when I became baptized and all this stuff. And, and I looked at him. I says, well, then my eyes opened. And he just looked at me. He just didn't even say anything. And then one of the other ones said something else. And. Oh, and then before we even sat down there, I had my Bible there. I went to sit down. He, he's like, put your Bible over there. One of the ministers, I says, you ain't telling me what to do. This is my house. And, uh, uh, and he just kind of kept talking to the other ones like I wasn't even talking because that's just the kind of guy he is. And so we sat there and we, we were having this conversation. And then one of the other guys said something again. I was like, well, I'll show you how you're wrong. And I go up to get my Bible. He says, sit down. You ain't getting it. I says, you ain't telling me what to do. Did I have to tell you again? This is my house. I do what I want. You, you're not running the show here. I, you know, I am. And so I got the Bible. He says, well, I'm not going to read it. I said, you don't have to read it. I'll read it for you. <laughs> and I read it off to him. And then my bishop's over there shaking his head. He says, uh, like, no, well, us Amish don't believe in that. I was like, well, it's the word of God, and I believe it, buddy. And if you don't believe what the Bible says, you might as well leave. I, opened, I closed my Bible, and I went in the house. And then they started getting up and, and walking out to the barn again. And then I remembered, thought of something else. I was just inside the door. I came back out. I says, oh, another thing I wanted to tell you. I was like, you're nothing but a bunch of Pharisees. I says, the Bible... I said, the Bible says it back in Revelations, there's a whole list of things in there that's going to go into the lake of fire. And I said, one of those things is, is liars. I said, if you stand up there in front of the church and saying nothing but lies, the Bible says if it's a lie, you're going to go into the lake of fire. So you better learn on what the Bible says. They turned around, looked at me, and called me a false prophet. So anyways, in the meantime, so they're, they're, they go out to the barn again, and then I'm like, so, so this really bothered me that he would actually say that they don't believe on something that I read out of the Bible. Because before this, I was like, I, I know, I, I know they're probably going to come against me, but what can they say? The word of God is the word of God, right? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's nothing, there's nothing there. You know why? Because this is not their final authority. You know, so in the meantime, Martha's telling me about the kids. We got to get the kids away. Got to get the kids away. So I walk back out there. As I'm walking out to the barn, not even saying anything, we're just walking out to the barn. My oldest son comes up, and he just grabs a hold of me right, right in the front here, and he tears my shirt all the way down. And my first instinct was, well, I'll show him who's dad, you know. It don't matter whether you think or not. That's my first initial second thought. But then all of a sudden, I just kind of like relax. I think it was the Holy Spirit came down, you know. And, you know, he's just up there just yelling and screaming in my face. And the minister is standing right here to me, you. They don't say a word. So then finally, they... Um, I looked at my bishop. I says, do you actually not believe in what the Bible says? He's like, well, yeah, yeah, but you can't just quote a verse like that in English. It has to be in German, you know. <laughs> so, 
So I'm like, well, okay. I says, but, uh, I says, where is that in the Bible? That has to be German. He had no answer. There's nothing there, you know. He had no answer. Well, in the meantime, so, so I'm telling you, you know, you got to let the kids come home. My uh, second son comes running out. Dad, I told you, you're never going to see your children again. So <clears throat> finally we ended up going back in. I ended up going back in because I, I told him, I'm going to have to call the sheriffs if you won't let the children come home. I said, well, call them. I don't care. That don't bother me anything, you know. Uh, that, uh, so I went in and I called the sheriffs. What else was I supposed to do? And they came right out. Well, you know, it takes them forever because they got to get everybody's information. They got to write it down, and, and it takes forever. I told them I want these people removed from the property, and I want my children brought back. And the reason I did that was because I wanted them removed from the property was because I knew in the attitude that they had, we weren't going to come to anything that, that evening. You know, so we might as well defuse the situation. So that's actually what happened. I actually have police reports of this, copies of police reports. Um, we could have got my son for assault and kidnapping. But, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't press the charges. But. So anyways, they ended up bringing the children back home. And the children are, when they came in the door, you could just see the devil right in them. I mean, the, the evilness coming in the door, and they just went straight upstairs. The red in their eyes. They went, we were, me and Martha were just sitting at the kitchen table. They went straight upstairs into their room, and Martha went up there to try to hug him, and my oldest son was going to hit him. And I told him, you better not dare it. And then he, he kind of backed off, and he was like, <sighs> he's like so mad, you know. And so the, the kids were crying. Well, they ended up all sleeping in the same bedroom, they all have their own bedroom. They all ended up sleeping in the same bedroom with furniture pushed in front of the door. So we wouldn't mislead them. So we wouldn't break down a door and, and force them. We were just sitting downstairs in the kitchen. We weren't even up, upstairs. And this went on for, for three nights they did that. Well, he had my oldest son, my oldest son at home, had a, uh, I had bought him a phone, a safe smartphone that had no internet on it. But they... But when you get those, it automatically has a Bible app on it. So he smashed that that night because it had a Bible app on it. And then my oldest married son had given him a phone, and he was like running a show. He was telling my other son what to do against us. And I, we couldn't get the phone away from him because I knew I had to, to, to kill the, connection, the, the communication there. And, but, but, but we couldn't do it. And the next day, I mean, uh, time's going, but... Uh, the next day, they actually uh, uh, started cussing us out. And, the, and you, these three children at home were never a problem. They were the most well-behaved children ever. Never had a problem with them once. They just turned us like that hard. They got brainwashed that bad in that, in that short of a time. And they, they are vicious. I mean, seriously vicious. And, 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 and this, went, this, went, this went on. And the next day, they, 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 they had a situation where they started cussing us out. And I, I told them, I says, you will not talk to me like this in my house. And this better quit right now. And then she started screaming, saying, you know, well, here, they had my oldest son on the phone. He called the cops. Cops came out. And we talked to them. And they just went out and had a long talk with them. So we knew that they knew what was going on, sort of. But anyways, time went on. This was, uh, it, it was like still walk on eggshells because they just wouldn't, we, we just, we didn't pressure them into anything. We just tried to show outpouring of love to the three children at home. The other children did come back the next night or the following night after this had happened and vehemently apologized to us. I just cried and just apologized how sorry they were. Just our, our children, the ministers never did, but uh, they, um, but they never stopped. They never stopped feeding the small ones against us. Um, but they, uh, <clears throat> uh, and we said the first night, we, when this happened, we said, Lord, forgive them because they know not what they do. You know, so, 
Uh, but it, it, it's, it's just, it, it, but, this, but the spiritual warfare was so huge. I mean, it was just, just we, we got so scared. I took all my, uh, they were accusing me of always having my office door locked. Well, everybody has their own personal space, right? And we were so scared, we didn't know what was going to happen that, that we ended up, we never locked our house, windows, nothing. We just, everything was wide open all the time. We went away, it didn't matter, we just left everything open. When that happened, we locked every window, every door, took all my Bible study materials, took all my guns out of my gun safe, put all my Bible study materials into the safe, locked the safe, locked the office. And, you know, uh, in the afternoons when I would take a nap, Martha would be sitting watching out the window. And then we would trade off because we didn't trust him because you just never knew what was going to happen next. I mean, seriously, it, it was scary. And, but we lived like that for like seven or eight months. And we just tried to win the children. Martha would, you know, instead of sitting around a table, we always sat around a table my whole life, all of my children. That was always a must. I mean, very seldom we didn't. Uh, she started just fixing food and putting it on the counter so where everybody could just fix their plates and then sit wherever they were. Even towards the end there, you know, some of my children might be, might have fixed their plates, sat down at the kitchen table. I would say, fix my plate, sit down at the kitchen table, they would up and leave. The spirit was so bad. And um, so <clears throat> it, it was kind of a situation, it finally got to the point where the situation where the, where the uh, um, where it was kind of a, just a, a, a standoff, kind of like he was just calm, but he, nothing was going on, but the situation wasn't changing any, it wasn't getting any better or whatever. And we went on, and, and the, uh, the, um, uh, so one day I came home with a truck, and that evening... My married children all got together, and all my children at home got together, and they had a big powwow about us or something. And we come home that night, and we were already in bed. This was like 11 o'clock. My oldest son comes home from bed from from where they were at in my daughter's house. He calls us out, and he says, "Dad, come here," you know. So he went out there, and he just start. And then the other two come down from the, from the upstairs, and they just start in us. I just, I mean, they were just, just at us. I mean, just condemning us and just, just anything you could speak. You could just see the devil come right out of these children. It was horrible. It was horrible. These well-behaved children that had no more disrespect, had no more respect for us at all. Nothing. Told us flat out in our face, we will never call you mom or dad again. And just, I, I, you know, I said, well, first thing, I didn't say a whole lot, but to start with, I just said, when they started condemning me, I said, first of all, you have to realize in this house, we're going to go by what this book says, not what man says. Yeah, but that's not how we do. And they just went on and on and on. I tried to tell them about hell, and she's like, oh, whatever. And it got so, it was so bad. And, you know, at this point, I've been, I've been walking on eggshells for like a year and a half. I mean, literally. It was like... You, you had like heads, you had to have eyes in the back of your head everywhere. You didn't know if anything was going to come at you or which direction was going to come from. And then we, we just prayed and cried that night. And I just remember I talked to Joe that next morning early. This was like middle of the night. We didn't even stay at the house. We left the house. And I knew when we were leaving the house because Martha said she, couldn't, she can't stay there that night because she actually, they actually told us, uh, they were like just viciously coming at us so hard and finally, Martha said, well, I'm going to go pray. Well, you might as well. You're just going to go pray to the devil anyways. And, you know, this is coming from children, young teenagers. And we never did anything. And uh, we were still dressed Amish and everything. The only thing was we just never went to back to church after that one night. We never went back to the Amish church. But we still lived there. We still dressed Amish, everything. Oh, we never got invited to any Christmas parties. They had Christmas without us. We had, I think we got one Christmas card out of all of our children. We weren't invited to her side or my side for Christmas, nothing. And we were still Amish, just weren't going to the Amish church. That's it. So we just, 
we just cried and prayed and prayed and, and finally it's like, well, it just looks like now isn't the time. And they were just begging us since that first night. They just kept on begging us and begging us all the time to let them go live with their, with their uh, older siblings. So finally, it's like, well, it's just, well, I knew about a couple weeks before that that it was just like beating a dead horse. I mean, it just seemed like it was. I mean, I didn't give up, but I just didn't feel like right now was the time necessarily. So, so I told them they can go. That, that day, and they came and thanked us with tears of joy that we let them go. And they moved all their stuff out that night. And that's all that's left for right now. I mean, there's more things that happen in between there, but that's basically it. That's where we're at. And we haven't heard one word of anybody since that. Not one. But I, I know one of the minister's uh, daughters is married to my oldest son, oldest married son, and he is, he's a very evil man. And he was coaching a lot of this from behind the scenes. But then it just makes, you know, like in Matthew ten thirty two, it says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came, to, came not to send peace, but a sword. For I, am not, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against his mother, her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Those were my foes. My own house. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not up, taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. And then in Luke 6, 2, 22, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Well, they used to speak well of me at one time. They don't know more. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them that which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Just think of how much zeal that they would have if we could turn this the other way for God instead of against God. And we pray for them all the time. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 4, 8 says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Second Timothy 3, 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I just had to, rem reminded me of, of John 8. Yeah. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But it, sometimes that comes at a cost, I guess. Huh? You know, and it, it just like in Galatians 4, 28, Now we, brethren, as Esau was, are the children of promise, but as then he that is born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. 
This was written, what, 6,000 years ago, and it's still true. You know, 2 Timothy, uh, it says, you know, and this, 2 Timothy 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, fierce, which they were fierce, despisers of those that are good, you know, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So, you know, there's, there, it's, just, it's just amazing. I had no idea this was going to happen. Nobody could have even tried to tell me it was going to happen. I would have laughed at him. But this is what happened. And like I said, there's actually, you know, there's other things that happen in between there that, some smaller things, but uh, I just bless them every day and I'm allowed to have my wife with me. I have so much to be thankful for. And <clears throat> ended up closing the business down. Uh, selling the house. We just got sold last week, and it's completely starting over, 100%. So much to be thankful for, and his blessings are so great. Um, Maybe I'll just finish with this. uh, the disciples, the disciples <clears throat> talk about stepping out of the boat. The disciples were not in a storm because of disobedience. They were in a storm because of obedience. They weren't in a storm because they had done something wrong. They were in a storm because of what they did was right. They were not in a storm because they were out of the will of God, but because they were in the will of God. Don't get the idea that if you live right and love God that you won't have storms. Many times storms come into your life when you are the closest to God. It's not because you have done something wrong, rather it may be because you have done what is right. So, I I guess, I, I don't know how to describe it, would it be because I jumped out of the boat instead of stepped out of the boat? Or was the boat jerked out from underneath me? I'm not sure. But either way, I went for a ride. <laughs> Ray and Martha, can you guys come up here? Mike and Kelly Campbell, where are you? Right there. Can you come up? There's a lot I could say, but um, Ray and Martha, I believe, Martha, we may publish your uh, testimony in our newsletter next time. Absolutely amazing testimony. But ever, you know what it's like to have physical wounds, right? Uh, they're painful. They're open. They can be open wounds and painful Emotional wounds work the same way as physical wounds. Uh, and I, I see this couple, and I, I can't help but think of uh, the deep emotional wounds that they have. I also think of the children. We have prayed for the children by name. I would like for you uh, to maybe see Ray and Martha and get the names of their children and just pray. We are claiming them for Christ. We have for a long time. And in a few weeks, I believe, or aren't you going to Mercer, Pennsylvania? Have you guys ever worked that out with that pastor? Oh. Uh, Well, we have a few people here from Mercer Baptist Church, right? 
right over here. Uh, be sure to go back, tell your pastor, uh, call these guys. They, uh, he wants them to come and share testimony, yeah. Mike and Kelly are house parents down here at the uh, New Beginnings Apartments, and um, would you guys just come around this couple, and, and uh, maybe Mike, you can pray for Ray and Kelly, for Martha, and uh, just pray over them, and, uh, uh, and when you're done, then we'll take a short break. When break is over, I believe we need to be back here by 1.10, at 120, Ephraim Stolzfus from Lancaster, PA, is going to preach for 60 minutes. I'm going to tell you right now, it is one of the best sermons I've heard in a long time. I cannot wait to hear it again. It's going to be as fresh as it was. Ephraim, we'll talk more about that. But uh, anyways, uh, you don't want to miss his sermon. It goes right along with what? Uh, it's perfect setup here. Uh, so here you go, Mike, and just dismiss it. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for Ray and Martha's testimony. We thank you for what you've done in their lives and just how you've completely changed them. We're all heartbroken at the actions of their children, and we just pray for them. We pour our, our hearts out to you for them, that you would save them, that you would send people into their lives to witness to them, that you would rip away their hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh that would seek you, that their children would be saved and they would return to them and that they could just live in the joy and fellowship of that. We just pray that you would help Ray and Martha as they deal with their children being separated from them and the heartache that comes with that. And just pray that you would put your blessing on them. Father, we thank you for Ray and Martha and we thank you that they're able to be in this battle together, that they are able to share each other's burdens and we pray that you will restore this family back to the unity that they once enjoyed. And we thank you that Martha is able to support her husband and pray that you will keep this family tightly bonded as they go through these trials. And we pray that you will give them a great victory in the end and that they will be able to come back to a future conference with all their children and just share everything that has happened and how you can be glorified through that. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 One more thing I, I just maybe want to mention real quick is, thank you guys. In Galatians, it talks about, Paul talks about, we've been crucified, buried, and rose again with Jesus. And, I know some, a lot of times we can't, we can't comprehend why can't we talk to people like that? Why, can't, why isn't there anything there? Well, it's because we died. I mean, when this happened, they had funeral for us for three weeks, and we were still there. But they, it was just like we were dead. It's because we, we, we went through the resurrection with Jesus. They no longer recognize us for who we were. Their old mom and dad are gone. 